Um, uh, my name is Chagai. I work for Tikal for over eight years. Uh, I uh, lead the DevOps team with two more colleagues. Okay, so you asked for a microservice architecture. You're going to pay for it. And before we just jump, and my personal background coming from operations, then going to configuration management, a little bit of development, and then back to DevOps. So the first question I had to ask myself is how does this architectural change influence our development process, our build process, and our deployment process? And I want to focus on a few principles or two main principles which are built out of four, which are one of them, and Yanai and Avi both, uh, both stress those out, is how do we rapidly provision? How do we um, monitor our application? At least we have to have a, a basic uh, monitoring to start with. And finally, how do we rapidly deploy our application? And the second point, and this really means in one word automation. And the second thing is, or the fourth point, which composes into two, it's the DevOps culture, which I think is the iteration, which is something that yeah, I also mentioned. Which means it's like going into, it's like running. Okay, so when you start off, you do, and now we can uh, correlate to that more than me. Um, so when you start off, you run a couple of miles, then you increase your pace and so on. And that's the same thing when we do rapid uh, deployment, rapid provisioning and so on. So our journey starts really by taking this monolithic application, which I presented before, into a microservice. So maybe to recap a little bit of what this service does, so we have a fleet tracker application which tracks GPS coordinates coming from a fleet of vehicles which going to the GPS service. Uh, the GPS service has a persistence layer of Mongo. And whatever it processes, it also puts into a, a message bus, which is a managed uh, topic by Kafka. That uh, stream of data goes into our GPS uh, service, or the, uh, yes, the GPS service. The GPS service then has uh, one, puts it into this uh, vehicles management system, which uh, persists with MySQL. Another stream of data, after going to the Google API and getting the X and Y coordinates into an address, we put them into um, the analytics layer, which has a, a persistence or a cache layer with Redis. And you can see what, where I'm going at where there's a lot of stuff to manage now, from my perspective at least. Another uh, message um, queue from the analytics layer, which eventually goes to our two notification services and um, transit service. So there's so many things now to manage, right? And vice versa, it goes on and on and on. Now one thing you can see from this slide, unlike, I mean, what and I did we had these uh, hexagons or uh, triangles, what was it? Hexagons, right. So I, I think one of the first things that we uh, really noticed, and Navi also mentioned, when did we start talking about microservices is when we standardized or dockerized everything, okay? Which gave us also the freedom of choice to have different uh, software languages and so on and so forth. So if I focus only on one service and I want to take this service and see how I actually build it, so I can see that A, I have this microservice called the GPS service. I have the Kafka queue topic I need to manage. And there's the database that I need to manage too. And four, Kafka also comes with a little zookeeper alongside it. So what I'm going to try and do now is really see how I'm going to take this single microservice, only one, and I need to actually put it through a development environment, a, a continuous integration environment, a staging or production, and how do I do that? And I think the first thing would, be, would go is to go to my developer and say, what is the most area, uh, the, most, the most common tool that you use which doesn't disrupt your day in, day out work? And how do you actually start working with it? So I think the most common uh, build tool for a Java application will be either Gradle or Maven. Um, we'll have a Java 8 application, which is uh, compiled uh, with it. We have the Mongo and the Kafka. So we, all, we need already all these components running in our development environment. So what do I need to 
deploy or uh, develop a microservice, I need one Docker host or Docker machine, depends how you want to call it, and you need a build tool. And those are the two th fundamental parts of developing a microservice. So creating a Docker machine, Docker host is quite simple. Today with Docker machine, it's just a one-liner and you've got a Docker machine running and uh, a valid environment and, the, and you're in. And basically from that point onwards, every Docker command corresponds to your Docker host or Docker machine. So what I want to try and do is really in build time, containerize my application. Doesn't matter what, again, build tool I'm using, if it's Gradle or Maven, okay, which is another option. And what I want to focus on is really a small task in my build which says create a container. And doesn't matter what the container does. And once I have this, uh, what this, contain what's this uh, task actually does, it looks at this Docker file. And this Docker file is really a contract between the developer and the, op and the ops guy saying, all I need to do is define from what image I'm going to build my application. And this uh, file really represents an image. And this image is the immutable part of the application, which is going to take me from the development environment and into production. And the two things that I care about is what the entry point of the application is and what port it exposes. That's the two things I really need to know about. And these are the things that I will probably uh, give uh, more information about when I look in my, in my environments. So I really more or less solved the developer part where I said, keep using your build tool, but here's another cool thing called Docker, which helps you deploy it. So how do I deploy? So because I need all these third parties, so I actually need to start building or mix and matching my environment by adding, for example, the Kafka, the Zookeeper, the Mongo, et cetera. So running a, a Docker command saying, Docker run minus D, what port to expose and so on, that's quite simple. So everybody can do that. But if I can already correspond to the Docker host, so why not wrap that all in into a, a Gradle or Maven talk too, right? So I could have like this functional test, which basically spins up three containers or four containers and runs my test suite against it. And it all ends by uh, at the end of it with a start container uh, task, which basically launches my application after all the dependencies already there. And if I was talking about the entire app, I would probably do that to all my microservices one by one, regardless to what build tool you're using. So if I had a Node.js application, I could have this Node task which does the same thing. And I don't care about if you have a Docker file as, you, as your code or you generated a build time. I don't really care as long as eventually my, when my, uh, the artifact that I collect at the end is actually an image which I deploy it. And how do I test multiple microservices with the same method? Okay, so I have this uh, a task in Gradle or Maven or Node, whatever, and I just run it for microservice A. I do the same for microservice B and I have an environment uh, working for me. And really if I am building images on the fly, what happens is I created this local repository uh, very similar to like you have an, an M2 repository for your Java uh, dependencies, which basically holds all those images just on my host, okay? I haven't pushed them yet. I'll get there in a second. So it all looks very simple, right? But I think the first challenge would be how to actually manage or how to do the wiring of all these applications together. So I have a few microservices which need to interact with one another. So the simple, uh, the first or the simplest uh, answer is configuration files, right? So we have this, uh, for example, for our GPS uh, gateway service, all we need to do is say, uh, tell the application how to reach uh, the persistence there, which is the Mongo. I need to tell it where to find uh, the, um, uh, the same uh, Zookeeper host, which uh, corresponds to my uh, Kafka um, uh, instance, and what topic to, to correlate to. Now, if we talked about before the loosely coupling of the applications, you can see here that all I care about is only the services which I have to interact with. This is the deployment unit which I'm going to deploy. And this is exactly what I did in the build tool. So I went to our, to our build environment and said, I need all these dependencies. I need this microservice. I build them all together, and that's how I launch them. Now, what will happen eventually when I go into, uh, if I look at this pipeline, is in development I've solved most of the problems which I will later on have to find a more creative solution for, but let's get there when we get there. So really I can have this uh, checkbox on this um, environment. 
So how do I scale? How do I go to the next uh, um, problem? Or what is the next problem? And I think the next problem is it works on my machine, which is the same thing that we had with a monolithic app. Uh, the same song that I used to hear from all the developers, which used to say, I committed the change, everything worked on my machine, and now I have the same thing. But let's get to that in a minute. The great thing about this solution, I think, in a way, is that it, is, it solves the CI problem too. Because if I have a build tool, which knows how to build my image, deploy it, and test it, that's all I need. And if, and if it's the only difference maybe is now I need to share the artifact of that build. Okay, so what I need to do in my CI environment is say, okay, if, I, if all my unit tests and all my integration tests, because the integration test here is how to talk to my stream. Did I leave the, uh, the right topic into the Kafka uh, uh, message, uh, message bus? Did I uh, persist uh, the data into the database there? If I did all of those and that succeeded, so what I have to do now is push the image. So another task that I will run within the same build environment is actually push that image into my registry. Now, one of the questions about application wiring or configuration is, what do I put in the configuration there? Is it just static uh, configuration? The first answer would be DNS, and that could work, right? I mean, if I just put uh, some kind of host name which will persist in all the environments, so everything would work fine, and that would be awesome, and my configuration file now, instead of saying the Docker machine IP, like I said before, it would actually specify some kind of DNS name. That would probably be great, and it will scale, and it will work fine until we need to do more complex stuff, which I'll get to in a sec, okay? So we can say that for the developer environment, the developers, the only change they had to do now is say, okay, we understood this microservice crap, we know how to actually extract our monolithic, monolithic application to containers, and, uh, to start your microservices, which I translated into containers, and because I gave them this Docker host with two liners of code, so they can also launch them. So there's nothing much to do there, and the same thing I did in CI. And I think that the biggest problem starts is when we want to scale our application. So we have this one uh, Docker host, which has my GPS service, and now it has another GPS service, and what do I do with that? When I have more than one, this is starting to be more complex to manage. And of course, if I have, and I'm getting dizzy a bit at the end here, that I have three or four or five of each different service, now my management issue or my DNS problem isn't as simple as I thought it is. I think what, the, what happens at scale, and that's the big question, and I think if we start thinking about why we moved to microservices was because of the scale issue, right? So we still have the same problem. And I think if we uh, really look at it, we have three things which we need in order to manage scale. First of all, the service discovery. The second is, uh, which really, if we look at, we talk about, um, we need service discovery, we need uh, clustering and scheduling, and I'll explain why, because if we need more than one instance of that specific app to run, we need to know how to schedule it, and we need to know how to uh, register more and more of those, and we need someone to orchestrate the entire process, because we can't you know, um, have some ops guy, and I think the guy that just said that we manage both situations uh, has already left, but it is more harder to manage on one hand, but if you have automation, and that's where we, we're thriving to, it's much easier, I think, in a way. And what it comes to answer is for the principle that started with at the beginning, is how do I do rapid provisioning? How do I do monitoring? How do I do rapid application deployment? And, and so on. So how do I do all these things? So I had to make some decisions, okay? And after a lot of blog reading, there's a bunch of, of tools here which really made my life much easier. And you'll see that I even need to add more to those. So it's really hard to manage, that I understand. But let's say how. Okay, so the decisions are to go with a console for service discovery, a registrator which helps me to register my services. And I want to emphasize the way this, this should work. If I have two GPS services uh, coming up, uh, to, uh, going to run in my environment, I need someone to actually, uh, I need to subscribe to some kind of service which I can then correlate to my other services so they can actually discover that service. So I'm using a basic pub sub, which you probably know from, from the way that you code your applications, right? Same, uh, uh, the same pattern, uh, the same paradigm. I needed someone to orchestrate the situation. Okay, so first of all, uh, so Jenkins is the most common tool, I think, to use for that. It's very easy to use. And the last thing is, um, 
I also use Ansible, but I use Ansible not because it's the best tool to do the job. Okay, for, for, for me as a DevOps guy, if I had to sit down and write a bunch of shell commands to launch all these different containers or provide all the ports, I would probably, it was very error prone to, do, to run them again and again and again. So Ansible really helped, uh, helped me to consolidate uh, my work in a way where I can say, I need to define my cluster. And uh, Avi can pay, probably tell you how to do the same thing with Terraform, which is another great tool, but there's so many tools here, I didn't want to add more to the mix. But basically, uh, Ansible helps me to define my infrastructure as code and manage it and deploy my application. So it really comes to answer both on configuration management and deployment at the same time. And finally, uh, if you want to add clustering to the, to the mix, so Docker Swarm just came out, uh, and it's, you can say we can start working with it, at least. So what is service discovery? So I want to talk about console for a sec. So what console really gives us is the ability to um, discover our services. And what, is, what does the discovery service mean? It actually ba basically means that you can ask someone, where can I find a GPS service? Where can I find a GPS gateway? Where can I find my, uh, my Kafka, whatever? So it's very easy for me to just use one point in my application, one stable or one source of truth which has all the facts for me to actually start working. Now the reason why DNS doesn't scale, by the way, because DNS has a lot of caching and services tend to go up and down. And I need, it, I need a more dynamic service which has a, a zero TTL in terms of the uh, records of it. So I would not recommend also to use uh, of course, console as a DNS service. And I've heard people trying to do that. The second thing is failure detection. So if a service goes down, I actually want to tag that, uh, that event and say, this service is unavailable anymore. It also has a key value store, which comes in handy when you want to do, for example, blue and green deployment. So you can really, um, you can register your entire service under the blue context, and then run the, the entire application, and then when you want to a switch to a new environment with a new version, you can basically put it in the green, uh, under the green context to switch your entire application without doing much. So a key value store comes in handy also in this situation. And the second thing, or the second, uh, or the fourth uh, uh, fact about console is that it has multiple data centers. So it's very easy to have like one uh, console cluster to serve your entire application or applications even. And, and a good example of how this would look at if the application, uh, what, what happens or why do I need, for example, a registry service? And why do I need registrator, for example? What console, all, uh, all it does, it says, is this service successful or is it failing? It doesn't say, I'm gonna take it down, I'm gonna bring it up. So I need someone to actually say, here's the new Redis service, here's the new Mongo service, here's the new GPS service, etc." And then I have this, uh, so this is just a UI but you can use any uh, uh, API HTTP uh, um, tool to actually query that and the application, it, of course, can do that automatically. And once I have this um, a service discovery in place, so I can resolve everything in DNS. So basically, if I put, for example, my GPS service dot service dot console into the configuration file, that would also scale in a way. Okay, so basically if I provide my developer with a small console container running in his developer environment, and I already showed you that I can uh, spawn those up because I have a Docker host handy on my development environment, so it's quite easy to manage. So a simple dig command for my GPS service brings that back. Scheduling clustering, so if I have already a service discovery facility for my applications and they can uh, query that service, get the information, configure, it, configure the app, and run, that's great, but what happens, how do I scale? How do I say, run GPS service on node A, run the GPS gateway on node B, and so on and so forth. And the second, one, uh, third is how do I orchestrate that, uh, that thing? So like I told you already before, I used Ansible to do that. And one of the, one of the things I try to do, and I'm still uh, working on, is basically using the Docker machine. And the reason I want to use Docker machine is not because it's the best thing since white bread, but it's because the Docker machine helps me do, take a lot of clutter. For example, all this TLS uh, uh, authorization between the uh, Docker clients and the uh, Docker machines themselves, so it's quite easy to use that. And there is a Docker machine um, module for Ansible, but it's not there yet. 
but it, for example, do, it does very uh, basic stuff. And because I told you already that I'm, I'm basically wrapping around, today what I'm doing is wrapping around writing everything in shell, but basically I'm calling the Docker machine API to instantiate those instances. So for example, if I wanted to bring up a Docker host, all I have to do is define or pass the arguments to it and it does it without any problem. And the same thing goes to every container in my, in my application. So if I have, and for exa this is a, an example of how I configure console, okay? So I can query, I can use Ansible's um, inventory to actually say what IP is running what service by just running a command and getting that into, and registering that fact into Ansible and then using it, which means that I can run the same Ansible code in any environment and get the same results, which is exactly what we want to do. So the big question I think after I answered all this is how does the infrastructure look like? Look like? Okay, so we have a mix here of Ansible and Jenkins and Mongo and Kafka and all these great services. How does it work? So my solution was based on saying I have one cluster, which is like a service cluster, which basically has my service discovery and my DNS services, my uh, ELK stack for all the monitoring and logging and so on. And then I have my application uh, cluster, which basically stores all my microservices and their immediate dependencies. When I say immediate dependencies, is I'm not going to put Kafka on my administrative cluster. That's my perspective, at least. So I'm not going to put Kafka alongside console because console might serve a different purpose. In addition to the fact that because we're scaling a monolithic up into a microservice, so we're probably, I do have a transition phase which I need to take care of. So the uh, cluster which I'm referring to as the yellow cluster is the cluster which is constant. It's, is, it really has all the services which I'm always going to use to all my application, even, my, even the remaining monolithic parts of it. And making it even easier to manage is just adding a swarm URL to the mix. So I let really, um, I let Docker swarm to manage or to say where each microservice is going to run. And because I'm using Docker machine, it's very easy to say, or adding a small flag to Ansible saying, the driver I want to use for a development environment is VirtualBox. The driver I want to use for CI is AWS, or DigitalOcean, or whatever. And it also has, it helps me to say, oh, I don't want the Mongo, I want to use a, um, a database service instead. And because I'm using, um, again, console, I can now say instead of using, um, instead of using MongoDB 01.service.console, use the Mongo Labs URL for, uh, for my uh, database. So it makes it very easy and very flexible to use those tools. Now I think, of course, the question is how does that inflict uh, the developer environment and if before I said that you have this Gradle that does all the magic, how do you do it now? And I want to do, I want to say something like one Mississippi, give me a Docker host with my microservice A, and I want to say two Mississippi with microservice two. And if I want to make life, easy, life easier because Docker uh, Swarm is so approachable also for a developer, and that's I think one of the fundamental parts that um, um, Docker did with the out uh, going of Docker uh, uh, Swarm is that it's very easy to bring up a cluster. It's very easy to say a Docker machine minus minus swarm and so on and so forth and get a swarm cluster running. And really the, the only thing that changed in my configuration is instead of using a singular Docker host, I'm using now a swarm cluster and he does all the wiring for me. And what you could also notice here that I added for my developers this uh, registrator and uh, console service which helps them have a small discovery service serving their application. Now, I mentioned Jenkins, I haven't even used it except for building. So if I want to reuse my infrastructure as code, which I wrote already in Ansible, it's very easy for me to come and say uh, Ansible playbook console uh, cluster, which basically brings up my entire administration cluster with all the services I need to uh, run or wire the configuration to my application. And the second one would be to actually create the fleet tracker cluster. And in there I can modulate all my different microservices and their dependencies in a, sequ in a sequential way in order to, uh, to scale them and, and run them. So all I have to do is really pass a small 
argument to my Ansible code saying what environment you want to run in, and that's it. So really what I did here is I created a pipeline, or pipelines in plural, which basically for each microservice I have a plan of how the microservice is built from my build tool, how it creates an image, how it deploys that image into my Docker registry, and how I pull that uh, container and run it in on my Docker machines. And I'm really doing very similar, uh, a very similar workflow in my dev environment, my CI environment, and of course there's a lot more, but I was asked to cut off about half of my presentation. So my staging and production for this example will be the same environment. So did we scale? So I don't think we're there yet. And I, and I'll say why. Because one thing that I, uh, I didn't mention is if I'm gonna zoom in on one of the services, what happens when I wanna scale a specific service? And in the, my Docker machine, one of the contract uh, uh, I, I defined in my development saying what port is actually the application is gonna listen on. But what happens when I have more than one service? So I have really, for example, my Java application listens on port 8080, that's great. And I run my Docker command or my Ansible wrapper to it. I say that the first microservice is 8081 and 8082 and 8083. So I really have the same service listening on different ports. So my configuration files are useless. Mm. And one of the things that I want to say is I need my, uh, my containers to stay immutable. I don't want to change them in production. I don't want to do any change to the actual container because that really takes me away from what I'm trying to solve by rapid deployment and rapid application provisioning, or application deployment, sorry. So really, if I, if I look at my Docker file, I don't want to go now in real time and say, listen on different port, or do, or here's a new configuration file. So really, what I'm looking for is dynamic configuration. So I really like where this, this is going, but how do I do that? The answer is HA proxy everything, more or less. And the idea was really, if I look at the developer environment, which has a configuration file which says, here's the DPS service, and this is this address, and this is this port, and here's the GPS gateway, and all the different uh, other microservices, if I put an Nginx in front of that, that doesn't change for the developer, it doesn't change for the CI environment, it doesn't change for the uh, staging or production. So it makes it very easy to manage. The only problem or the missing spice here is, how do I configure my HA proxy to have these changes. So thank God for console template. Console template is a tool which enables you to, in real time, get the context of the application from console in real time, which means if I just deployed a GPS service, all I need to do is generate the HA proxy configuration to suit my new deployment. And it will look something like this. So this is the top um, part is the template, which has get the GPS uh, gateway front end, that's my context of the application, give me the ID of the specific service so you have more than one of them. It will of course um, create, like you see here, two lines of code, which means that now I have a HA proxy which really does a uh, round robin on that specific service, which means if one of them fails, this is generated automatically and my application continues to run without uh, feeling a thing. So this is really configuration hell all over again. The question is how do that uh, solve my uh, problem in development again? I think that's uh, one of the things that uh, I was uh, privileged to, uh, uh, to experience was the, that bouncing between dev and ops all the time. So really what happened to the developer environment? Not much because I can just HA proxy and everything also in the developer environment and it looks exactly the same. So my development experience, although I'm using a more complex system, all I did was define it once and it should work all the time. So really, um, the way the environment would look like now is that I have multiple uh, pipelines, I have Jenkins triggering Ansible to deploy each microservice, and I have a build service which basically spits out that image into that Docker registry and just pulls it down onto the uh, Docker host and I have an application up and running. And because again, I'm using that wrapper of Docker machine, it's very easy for me to say, Okay, now I'm running in AWS, now I'm running in Nigel Ocean, and so forth, and so forth. So I think to recap, what we did is we took this monolithic application from development to CI to staging and production, and it exploded into a bunch of microservices which I 
had no clue of how to manage uh, or work with. And I found, I think, one solution or one pipeline for each microservice which says, okay, if you want to work with Gradle to build your app, fine. Just remember that the deployment unit that you need to produce is a Docker machine, which becomes an image that Jenkins knows how to build plus deploy or take that container and put it in my re registry and then propagate that into my staging and development environment and so on. And I have a, a template which generates the configuration for my staging, production, whatever environment which I need to, and it doesn't change the experience and it doesn't change the coherence of the application. And I do the same thing for all my services regardless of, of what I'm using. So I think to summarize, scaling isn't easy. Docker make it super cool. And there's a bunch of great tools out there, all open source, that helps us uh, do that. And of course, it's achievable. So thank you very much. <laughs>